I actually was very excited to come down. I, I, I realized this morning I botched it on the slides on the deck because I have a picture of, I think it was the sophomore Soxbury, with you know, Cedar High back in 1984 could put on a really amazing sophomore Soxbury. And I was sitting there with my date and I have a big SUSC football shirt on. And I wish I would have brought that picture just as a shout out to the old SUSC um, that I grew up in. So I, I was raised in Cedar City. I um, loved coming on campus. It was Southern Utah State College at the time. Um, really fun place um, for me. So I'm ex excited to come back. I also really enjoy being with undergrads. I only get to teach graduate students generally. Um, and so there's a few things that we'll talk about uh, as, as an intro, but I think once we get about 20 minutes into it, if you have questions or um, I'd almost rather talk about things you want to talk about. So when we start moving more into the legal stuff and that, feel free to ask questions and we can ebb and flow the Q&A if you have questions um, based on on, on how interested you are in some of those topics. But first, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background uh, for me, which explains sort of how I approach entrepreneurship, how um, I approach you know, business formation. And it'll be a little bit different than I think a lot of the speakers because um, I have tended to observe what's been going on not so much as an entrepreneur myself, but I've spent a lot of time working with entrepreneurs. So I, as I mentioned, graduated from um, Cedar City High School. I decided, I, I was, when I was in high school, there was, um, there was a professor from up north that was coming down and hitting all of the high schools and pulling out three or four students and, when I was a junior and converting them to go into a brand new major. This is a major that had just been created and they were trying to populate the major with students coming into college because no one in college was interested in it. And it was this brand new thing called computer science. And so that was, I went up, uh, I started college with the idea like, oh yeah, I'm gonna be a, in computer science. And that lasted about a year. And I, I would finish my homework and go back to the dorms and wanna go play basketball or something. And everyone else in my major, they would go home and start working on the stuff they really like to do, which was their coding. And I, just, I could just tell that wasn't going to be my thing. So um, I was getting ready to go on a church mission. And um, I decided right before I went, well, maybe I'll go to law school. I had no idea what law school was. I had no idea what really lawyers do other than just go into the courtroom. And, and so I ended up majoring in Near Eastern Studies. So I learned Hebrew and Islamic philosophy which means I had to go to law school if I wanted a job or to do anything useful to society. So it sort of locked me in. Um, I went to law school and then I ended up coming out of law school really interested in finance and um, business and I had no background in any of that. So, you know, I think there, there might be some of you in here that are interested in going into business or entrepreneurship, but you maybe are like me and you have more of a liberal arts background, or um, it's just you feel intimidated. After four or five years in the space, I was very comfortable dealing with the MBAs, dealing with the accountants. Um, so don't, don't let that hold you back. I mean, it's, you can get it, right? Don't, don't necessarily feel if you don't have a strong finance or accounting or business background, but you really have some great ideas to run a business, don't feel like that should in any way you know, limit what you think you can do. Because in my experience, the, the, the really good idea people can learn business, but often the business people can't learn the really good idea kind of idea. So um, I ended up becoming a securities lawyer in Salt Lake, uh, which is we raised money for companies. And I ended up um, really en enjoying it more than I thought I would. And so ended up bouncing out to a, a medium-sized firm in Dallas, Texas after a couple of years. And then I moved up to a really big international um, firm. Thought I would stay there for a couple of years, do the typical thing and go work for a company, go in-house. 
but, but I really enjoyed it. So I stayed there for um, 12, 13 years. I was partner for most of that time. And in that experience, I mostly represented the money. Right? So we didn't represent small companies or development stage companies. We represented the, the, the Series B, Series C, Series D rounds of people investing in those companies. And I did what's called a lot of institutional funds. So I represent a lot of, of companies either investing or seeking into like multi-billion dollar funds, right? And, and so most of my experience early on was, was coming in as a lawyer on behalf of a client, looking at a company that was looking for some financing and then and reviewing everything about their company and going back and telling the client whether or not, you know, what were the risks involved, how clean is the company, how much confidence do we have in the founders? Um, so sort of from that perspective, does that make sense? And then every once in a while, we'd make the investment and you know, um, the first thing we would do is often fire the lawyers and, and then we would come in and actually sort of start working on the companies cleaning them up. So um, in private practice, that was the, the approach I had to what I think a lot of you are doing. And it was really from the view of I'm investing in you what makes me nervous about you that would maybe have me walk away? What is a deal killer that would, that would absolutely make me walk away from um, investing in you? And what are the things that we liked, right? Some of the, and we'll talk a little more about what those, what those things were. Um, after doing that for several years, then I rotated out. Then I, I left private practice and moved to a, a company that at the time was just, it was just Match.com, which was a one of the I think there's only two websites in the world right now that have been around longer than Match, and Match is I mean it just prints money I mean it's 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 really successful, and it was probably worth two or three hundred million dollars at the time, and and when I left six years later it was pro I think we just had, we just took it public, and I think the market cap got up to like thirty six billion. So it's maybe like, like nine or 10 billion when it optimizes. So for most companies moving from two or 300 million to, to nine to 10 billion, that's a really successful company. And we bought a lot of companies that were development stage, that were pre-revenue, um, that were just ideas. Sometimes we bought them because we liked their people. Sometimes we bought them because we liked their idea. Sometimes we bought them just to tank them, right? Just to we were nervous that they were going to compete with us. We didn't like them, so we'd just buy them and shut them down, right? And so that moves into more of an experience in sort of your space of sort of the 800-pound gorilla. We sort of come in and and we would, I would see a lot of companies in, that were in one of those three buckets. But then we also had an incubator company, just an, an, an internal company that we just paid money. We just paid people to just come up with ideas. And out of that company came a little company called Tinder. And so I was Tinder's first lawyer for the first five years. And it probably took nine years of my life out of me um, <laughs> dealing with the Tinder folks. But we'll talk a little bit about the Tinder folks um, later. But so, yeah, so then I saw um, sort of entrepreneurship and starting with a, an idea with I mean, really, it's sort of embarrassing to say, but it's probably one of the most successful startups in the last 15 years. I think Tinder is probably about an $8 billion valuation. There are very few companies, software, especially software, especially web-based um, companies that have gone from zero to $8 billion in the last, in the last um, and that's just internal valuation. It's never, it's never been sold, never been flipped. But so then I had the experience of, of being in the weeds with um, a company that just really had a remarkable growth and a interesting history, to say the least, um, along with some other companies that also did well. And I'll sort of come back to that. So does that make sense? I mean, so it's a little bit of this really broad 360 view of entrepreneurship and startup and development stage companies and and what did I see was just really remarkable founders, but just lazy ideas, and sometimes really interesting ideas with, with founders that botch it, and then the, the ones in the middle, the ones that have really interesting ideas and fun ideas, and some of them very, very simple. Some of the most interesting stuff we saw were, I mean, you cannot get something more simple than Tinder. You just can't. I mean, it is literally, 
they, so we had a company called OKCupid, okay which I'll talk about in a minute, that all Harvard mathematicians, one of them had a PhD from MIT, and, and, and their whole philosophy was is give us enormous amounts of data. We will run these really fancy algorithms. And then out of our, you know, if you're in New York City, out of the 45,000 people on, active on the site now, we'll sort of pick and choose and show you who we think you'd be interested in or who would be somebody that would be, um, be compatible with you. Um, so a lot of math, a lot of data, and in the Tinder, um, I just call them the Tinder bros because they were sort of bros. You know, they're dropouts from USC and they, they came with the approach to say no. It's, number one, no one could solve the gamification quest in online dating at the time. This is in 2000, um, 2011. Um, no one had really picked up, a lot of people had tried. Um, and the, the, the Tinder folks said, you know what, we don't, we don't think that you, you need a bunch of data. We don't need to know your um, political beliefs, your eating habits. Do you exercise? Are you a gamer? Do you like the outdoors? Are you a PhD? Are you a high school dropout? You know, all the stuff that they would collect. We think your brain does that. Right? You, you walk into a room, and if there's a bunch of people that are single and you're single, you're, you know, you know, how you, you, know, you wear a hat, you have it on backwards, right? You're making a statement by doing that. You have a hat, you're wearing it forward, right? And how people, how they dress, how they present themselves, they're telling you a lot about them. And their view is all you need are pictures and, you're, and the person's brain will do all of the analysis based on how you present yourself to me. You know, the, you know, the, how, how, you, how you dress, how you, again, how you present yourself, you're, you're making a lot of statements about your value, about what you're interested in, what you would be like to hang out with. And so their thing is, is we don't want any data. We don't care about any data. And we are just going to make it fun. And all we want are pictures. And, and then you see the swipes. That's just extraordinarily simple, compared to the OK Keep It folks, that's an or extraordinarily simple idea. And, and the OK Keep It folks, they walked away with several hundred million dollars in the pocket and the Tinder you know, ended up producing something worth billions. Um, so, being complicated is not, is, is not what, um, in my mind, results in a really successful idea. Um, so, first, I'll do two things from here on out. Um, oh, then I came to BYU, and I, I don't research, I don't publish. I, I just teach students how to be lawyers on the transactional side. So, how do you form companies? How do you deal with how companies operate? How do you deal with how founders make decisions amongst themselves? How do you kick people out? How do you bring them in? Um, how do you protect your intellectual property? How do you buy a company? How do you sell a company? Um, and so I teach a, uh, classes that are, that are all skills based, um, no textbooks. We just do simulated deal after simulated deal. And then I also teach a class that I really have found really interesting it's my only undergraduate class. We have a thing called the Crocker Fellowship where you have to apply and every team has an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, an industrial design student, a software development, a business student, and what we call the wild card, which can be an English major, science major, econ, whatever. It, it, there's no limit to the major you can be. And we have five teams. Each one has each one of these students on their teams. And um, we give them like 10 grand on January and say, just find a problem and solve it by December. But it has to be interdisciplinary, right? You have to use the skills of all the people on your team. So you can't just do a software-based product because the engineers are going to be bored. You cannot do just a, a, a widget because the software people are going to be bored. You have to do something to keep the business people busy, right? And, 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 and often the wild card um, person will have an input on what industry you go into. And I've found it really interesting to see these students try to interact with each other and, and, and have respect for the other skills that the other, um, that the other teammates have. And it's a real struggle for a lot of them. It's a real struggle for the engineers to have respect for what the business people are doing. It's a real struggle for the business people to appreciate what the engineers are doing. And so that's another element of what I've seen in the last five or six years we'll, we'll talk about um, in a bit. So the, the two things we'll, we'll um, talk about from here on out is one, just some observations about from me on what I've experienced of 
just dealing with entrepreneurs and um, those that develop and build businesses um, generally. Um, I, I do have a friend of mine that when I was at Baker Botts at my old firm, I did his work. He, he actually just has a pest control company at the time. I left to go to Match. He moved to San Diego, started building his company. I stopped doing work for him. When I ended up going back to BYU, when I went to BYU, I, I picked up the work for him now, and I do his um, I do his legal work for him. And now he's grown to, you know, he had a single pest control company in Dallas, and now he has like 39 joint ventures, and he's probably the companies are probably worth 400, 500 million dollars. And I really admire. His, how he approaches business, how he treats his employees, how he treats his partners has really been inspiring to me. And you'll see a lot of that in some of these slides coming up. Um, and then we'll spend the last half or the last few minutes just talking about just legal ideas and concepts and things to avoid. Or, and, and we'll have time, we'll take some questions there. We go to 1220, right? Okay. Um, all right. So the first um, concept is this idea, like, and, and you're going to see a heavy dose of, what's, of my you know, eye roll to Silicon Slopes. Right? There's, there's really this, I don't know if you've heard of Silicon Slopes. It's this trendy thing in Utah and Salt Lake County. And there's a lot of research and some analysis coming out of Silicon Slopes that is, they're trying to figure out why we're not getting second, third generation um, founders. It's just, I, you know, Companies like Apple and Intel and, you know, and Google, sort of the Silicon Valley folks, they just, they just seem to produce second, third, fourth generation idea people that start there, they get trained, then they go out and do their own company. And Silicon Slopes doesn't seem to be doing that yet. It just seems to be the same nine people showing up year after year after year. And um, so people are looking at the idea about why that's happening. And if you talk to most of the entrepreneurs up there, they're like, I want to get wealthy, right? And they attribute that. You know, the concept of wealth is an abundance of, it's not just money, right? That, and they just, it's just money. And so there's an L, we'll come back to one of the idea, but this idea, this, a lot of it coming from is this, idea, this, this article that's really being, um, I'm seeing um, being shared a lot within the sort of the West Coast innovation and entrepreneurship community um, posted by a guy named Jack Rain, so I know nothing about him, but it was an interesting article about what wealth is and how entrepreneurs should view it. And the, you know, the first idea is you have money. And there's this idea, you've probably seen the research on this, that it's, there's an assumption that the more money you get, the more happy you will be. And there is study after study that shows once you get to a certain level where your needs are met and you don't go into a panic if the tires go out on your car, the, the, the satisfaction of life that results from additional money literally falls to zero. I've seen some studies that show actually a big dip between like two to four or five hundred thousand, where actually the more money you make, the more unhappy you become. And then it sort of recovers. And, and a lot of, I think a lot of people get really bothered by the fact that they start to make real money and they don't, their life doesn't seem to get better. Um, and, there's this quote I liked that says, some luxuries won't make your life any better, but losing them after you experience them will certainly make your life worse. So I'm going to ask you one question to see. So when I was at Match, whenever we traveled, I was, I was a senior executive, and so um, I traveled a lot at Match, and I traveled a lot at, um, for BYU Law. Anyone have any idea about what luxury I enjoy at Match that I do not enjoy at BYU, that this quote hits right on the head? Class yeah, I traveled first class. <laughs> and when I started traveling first class, I thought, man, this is sort of cool. I saw, okay, you get to lay down. I didn't sleep any better. I don't drink, so all the alcohol provided no benefit to me whatsoever. And the food was marginally better. But for the most part, you know, it was, I thought it was okay. Um, at BYU, I do not travel first class. But I walk down, and when I do the right turn instead of the left turn on the plane, I just I die a little bit every single time I do that. <laughs> and it, I, it's actually, it, it, I actually, I, this seems so true to me that it didn't really make my life any better doing that, but boy, after losing it, it certainly made my life worse. And so there's, there's an element of money. If you're just like, I want to make money, you're, you're going to plateau if you're lucky, and your life satisfaction is going to just drop like a rock. And that's sort of the whole theme of this, of this article going forward. Um, 
So they point out to say, look, knowledge is really valuable. This is why I like talking to students here. You know, there's, there's a vibe for a while with entrepreneurs like, you got to get out of school. School's a waste of your time. Well, if you look, Harvard Business School did a study one time, and the average age of the most successful founders are 45. That's the average age of successful startups and founders. And they decided one of the reasons why is because at that age, they're just smarter than the 23-year-olds and 25-year-olds. They just have more knowledge. They know how to run a business. They know how to scale. And I think there's some, in some circles, there's this idea that, oh, if you're 25 or 28 years old and you haven't already hit your first million, you're a failure. The data shows the exact opposite. There's a, there's a few people that will hit it when they're young, but most of the high growth startups come with people that actually have a little bit of knowledge and they almost all got degrees. It's very rare. You know, don't listen to Peter Thiel. You know. Zuckerberg, sure, he dropped out of Harvard, but he also was a trust fund baby. He had, his dad said, you spend all the money in the world you want. If you fit into that, you could probably be successful. But most people, a college degree and learning how to learn Learning how to appreciate the skills of others will always put you in a better position than, um, than you know, putting your nose up against a degree and just going out on your own. And the data seems to show that. So you know, to get this idea that knowledge just isn't simply an, a, a means to an end. Knowledge is not something that's just like, oh, it'll just make me rich. No, knowledge is actually worthy goal in and of itself. And I'll, t I'll come back a little bit more about that when I talk about the Tinder versus the OkCupid okay, folks. Um, a, second, a third form of wealth is time. And, um, and you have this, you know, this model, like you probably have a lot more time that's available to you now than you are a little bit later, once you start doing more things in life. And there's this reverse reality of life that you tend to have the most time when you have the least money, and you have the most money when you have the least amount of time. And being able to sort of make this X more of a line the, the research shows that entrepreneurs that are able to do that, and this is one of like, the problems of Silicon Slopes right now, is just people want to get rich so fast. It's just, it is just push, 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 push. And at best, you get a, a little crossing at one point. And there's an element of, there's, there's, there's no race or award for pushing so hard to get something done that you look back and realize you ended up wasting a lot of time for something that didn't bring you, you know, as much satisfaction as you thought it was. So this idea of time, you know, the, the, the author said, look, time is the antithesis of wealth. You can't see it. You can't compare it. You don't, you know, you can't, if your neighbor drives up with a nice car and it makes you feel really bad about yourself, you can't up them by buying a nicer car with time, right? Um, and if, if, Wealth is, is, if monetary wealth is, is displayed by possessions, time is displayed by nothingness. It's just, you just have freedom to do what you want to do. You ignore it when it's abundant, and you desperately want it when it becomes there. Um, so if you blow all your money, you can always make more, but when time runs out, game is over. Um, the fourth thing they note is, is health. And again, the data seems to show that a lot of entrepreneurs, they really do not invest in their health very well. Um, when they're younger, and um, the, the quote is, 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 in finance, compound interest is a powerful force, but compound interest isn't solely reserved for finance. The most valuable application is your health. The person who doesn't take care of their health in their youth might not notice any effects early on, but the laissez-faire approach is catastrophic when you grow older. Um, and you know, the, the Confucius quote is great, a healthy man wants a thousand things, a sick man wants one. Um, and I'm starting to see that at my age. Right? I'm starting to see the, the people that um, used health as a measure of wealth when they were younger. The dividends start to pay off when you, things start to slow down. Metabolism is not what it used to be. Joints start to fall apart. And when you're talking about who is a wealthy person, um, the older you get, the more health becomes something that seems a lot more important than money. And the decisions you make when you're 23 and 24 and 19 have a shocking um, amount of implication when you get to be 40s, 50s, and in my case, almost 60. Um, health is the cousin to time. We rarely think of it when we have it. Eat poorly, never work out. It doesn't matter. You're young, you'll bounce back, but ultimately decisions compound. You don't change who you become. Once you have it, you don't care about it. Once you 
Um, and, and I like to quote the, the author note. He said, health is, its greatest value is also money's greatest value. It's the optionality and freedom it gives you. It's not the things you get. It's the ability to be free and do what you want to do. Um, number five, he talks a lot about experiences. Um, I just saw, I don't know, some dude on Twitter, the purpose of life is to experience things you'll later experience nostalgia. Right? And, um, and it's the idea of a lot of people are, are, you know, I like this quote here about life, the, a good goal in life is to be rich in experiences and sufficient in finances. Those tend to be the happiest, most wealthy people. And the habits you develop and, um, and also the most meaningful experiences you have, it's, it's, it's generally not going and sitting on a beach by yourself and sitting there and to admire all the money you have. It's, if you don't have people to go with, and, and if you're also not involving to where you're trying to make the world a better place, the people that are able to do that and value that and really incorporate it into their worldview, they're just more wealthy. They just are more satisfied and they're happier. Um, and again, the common thing that research is showing is that people maximize um, for 40 years, uh, they minimize a higher form of wealth, which is experiences, enjoying life and doing things um, while during those 40 years to maximize a lower form, which is money. And then you spend your last years vainly trying to recapture what you've missed. And you see those people around you and it's sort of pathetic, but, and it's becoming more and more common with the now J aging generations of the, of the entrepreneurs and innovators. Then the last thing of course are relationships. And it, 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 we'll spend a little bit of time here and then we'll, we'll roll off into, into some legal ideas. Um, I don't know if it was the Zappos guy. Did you follow the Zappos guy's demise? I don't know if you followed. Zappos is a little bit predates you. One of the most famous innovators in Silicon Valley founded Zappos and a bunch of other things. Um, and the last five or six years of his life were just, he was literally paying for people to be his friends. And just sort of the whole thing fell apart. He committed suicide. And, and the idea, that, the idea that if you don't develop, again, the quote from the article, every other form of wealth is irrelevant if you have a scarcity of relationships. And a lot of innovators um, are, that are coming into their 30s and 40s, they are really struggling to develop relationships that are meaningful because they always viewed people as who can I monetize, who can I take advantage of, who can I get the most work out of and pay the least amount. And over time, no one wants to be friends with those people unless you're buying something for them. And so they essentially pay for their friends to go on trips with them. And, they, and this idea about not losing focus of relationships as you are in the flux of trying to build a business or coming with an idea is becoming more and more apparent as, as more and more research is done on, on who are the innovators and entrepreneurs that ended up with a fill, a satisfied and happy life, and those who just literally spend their time with drugs, alcohol, and therapy to get through the day. Um, and you know, time, good health are only valuable if you have the capacity to share it with people that you care about. Otherwise, you're wasting your open calendar and able body on frivolous distractions. A wealth of knowledge is all right and good, but knowledge is best used when it's shared with others. Uh, his quote was, the only difference between a master and a hermit, I would say a mentor and a prodigy, are the presence of students. Right? Um, we have a lot of really rich people that are hermits. So these are the um, groups I used to work. This is an example. So the, the ones on the left, you, I don't know if anyone recognize this person here? It's probably a little, just a few years too. She was really, really the poster child of um, female innovators. It's, it's still a lot, not, not a lot of women right now in Silicon Valley. She's multi-billionaire. Doesn't recognize anybody. She's from Salt Lake. She grew up in Salt Lake. Didn't live there long. Her name is Whitney Wolf. Anyone heard of Whitney Wolf? She formed Bumble. So Sean Rad, founder of Tinder. Justin Bedeen, founder of Tinder. Some groupie. I don't know who she was. But you know, this. The only thing that if you Google any of these folks, um, are they, and, then, and then you have the okay Cupid folks. These are the, the the four Harvard mathematicians that you know. One went to MIT, PhD. Went to Stanford, MBA. They did okay Cupid. And then you have when we went public, Greg Blatt. Our CEO, Sam Yagen, who's just here, he's the CEO of, of OKCupid, and Sean, who the, was the CEO of Tinder. 
If you Google these people, the thing that comes up with this group is an unbelievable amount of lawsuits. They, she sued both of them, they've sued him, she sued him. They, they, they are I mean, just, the lawyers have made a mint off the Tinder founders. Just, um, they have made so much money. Um, I think these two have sort of stayed together as friends. I'm not entirely sure. But if, Google any of them and you'll just, you'll just see article after article detailing how bitter and unhappy they all are with each other as a founding group be, um, and they have more money than they can spend. These four are like best friends for life. These are the four though that I remember that if, you know, you have to remind them to cash their checks, right? You know, they'd, you'd give them a you know, comp or payment and they put it in the drawer. They're like, oh yeah, I've got three or four of those. I need to go cash them. They just loved what they were doing. These people, they only wanted money. That's all they cared about. They could have cared less about the product. They could have, they actually, they were just, they loved what they were doing. They loved the ideas they're coming with. And, I, and when I would go, and he just scares me. He just throws staples at me all the time, and he was just sort of scary. But um, when I would go to lunch with these folks, it was just engaging. It was interesting. We talked about lots of different things. It were, it were people that I really respected. Um, go to lunch with these folks, and it was just like, you know, it's just painful. You have to go home and take a shower when you're done. And, and so there's a difference between re relations, how you treat each other. And in some respects, this is coming down to what is popping out of Northern County um, entrepreneurship. And I, I really get a sense that Southern Utah hasn't, you're not dealing with this. Um, and I think there's a lot culturally, I think it's just a lot of the caliber of people that are here, um, what the expectations are. If they're struggling to keep employees. As I said, they're really struggling to get second generation leaders and innovators. And after this study, what, this, what people are asking for, they don't want more ping pong tables. They don't, they don't want more nicer catered lunches. You know, they don't want in-house dry cleaning. They just, they want leadership, right? They want it, essentially they want to be treated better as employees. They want to be treated more respectfully. And what the employees really want is they want expectations, they want autonomy, right? They want to be able to learn and grow and develop. Um, and what most of them are saying is like, we're not getting any training, we're not getting coach, any leadership, in part because the founders don't seem to be care about relationships. They're so intent on getting an exit so early that they, they're just not taking time building relationships, treating employees as, and uh, co-founders and partners as um, peers and it's I mean it's sort of hurting the overall environment um, so the last thing I'm going to say and then we'll pivot to legal is um, well we'll come back to this one um, going to relationships well I'll go back so we my wife is here we we decided to we bought a big house because Literally, our kids are all gone. We've got a house, it has more space we needed to, but literally the color scheme matches with our furniture in our old house in Texas, and I just didn't want to buy new furniture, right? So that was like the, the, the determining factor of buying this house. But we had this ridiculously stupid master bathroom and a bedroom upstairs we didn't need. So we decided let's redo the bathroom and let's knock out the, the wall and let's put the, the um, um, Make it into a master closet. Because in Texas, if you don't have a master closet the size of your apartments, you don't have a real house, apparently. <laughs> and, and we sort of got converted to the, but it was expensive. And I thought, you know, I should be able to do better things with my money than, it just seemed frivolous. It just seemed like a waste, right? And so if you have the extra 100 bucks in your pocket, what would you do, right? Would you spend it on a vacation, not a vacation, but would you spend on something on yourself? Would you save it for a rainy day? Or would you give it away? Right? That's sort of the, my, my model of how I viewed, and that says a lot about who you are. What do you do with your excess? Right? You got a little bit of extra, what do you do with it? It, it really says a lot about, and anyway, we decided to do it, you know, it was like 80 or 90 grand or something. And one day, this is not a picture of it, but one day I was in there and this, the, the tile guy was there and he was laying all the tile. And he was doing a really good job, but I could tell from his truck outside and um, interacting. This was not a wealthy person, right? But he was awesome at what he did. And 
he was coming out one day, and I walked with him downstairs, and I, you know, I said, this looks really good. Thank you for doing such a, I mean, I'm, I'm going to live with this, and I've, I really appreciate you doing such a good job. And he turned to me, and he said, thank you for giving me a job, right? You know, th this is the kind of thing that, like, he goes home, and he's like, to his family, he's like, I have a good job. But we did not, we did not negotiate them down on the price. We just said, what's the price? We take it, right? Just, you value it. And, um, and I've really come to learn that, that, you know, with your excess, some of you are going to be going to do really well. Um, this idea of valuing other people and not, and, 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 and hiring them to do skills they do good at and paying them what they're worth is enormously important to having a satisfactory life, you know. And I think how you treat your employees, how you treat your colleagues, if you're trying to get more out of them than you're willing to give, and you're trying to pay them the bare minimum of what you can get, you know what, you're, just, you're not on a good path, and it's not going to be satisfying. The, the relationships you build and how you treat people really ultimately come down to who you become and whether or not you're happy. And, I, and, and sometimes it's surprising. So this is me 20 years ago or something, and I've, I coached a lot of basketball and soccer teams. And this guy right here, I coached him in basketball, soccer and baseball, and he played pro football. So the one sport, obviously, that I didn't, didn't coach him. And he sent me a note the other day. He, he plays for the Cardinals now. He's a quarterback. Um, and he, and he, he sent me a note and he said, you know, some of the best memories playing sports come from playing on your team. I just want to thank you for the impact you had on me. That means more to me than the multi-billion dollar deals I worked on for all the money I made. And just some of the relationships you build with the people that you're working with, um, they really make really important. Okay, so we have 10 minutes. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's pivot. Um, if I'm in front of you and I'm like, okay, these are all the legal issues that startups and young companies can have, okay? Um, I want you to spend like 15 seconds to look at this and decide which ones, if you have very limited time and money, should you care about when you're early stage? Any ideas? Anyone want to throw out what you think you, if you don't pay attention, you could maybe not recover from them? Employment. Employment, that's one, good. Two more. No guesses? Um, that's important, but if you don't have any money, no one's going to come after you. All right? And if you don't do it really bad, you won't go to jail. Right? But yeah, you shouldn't deceive people. Um, yeah, but you can recover from that, actually. Pay a small fine, you can pay for it. You, know, that, you can actually recover from that. It won't kill your company. Again, these are all important, but some things you cannot recover from. IP, yep. Watch the social network. Have you seen the social network? All right, we'll talk about that in a minute. So the three really are, if you don't have corporate structure or employment or intellectual property problems, you may not be able to recover from them. And, um, um, and so I'm going to pause here until just one more minute, and then we'll take questions about, I think, these three topics, if you have questions about legal topics. But I want to mention before we end, so at the law school, we run a clinic. And it's mostly for Utah County, but I would love to get SUU students and businesses in the clinic. And this is all the stuff we'll do for you for free. Okay? If you have a company, you need to know, OK, what type of company should we be? Where should we form? How should we form? Getting it formed getting your documents in place to issue your equity, your ownership, getting your documents in place as to who gets to make decisions, how do you run, you know, having the board and stockholders do decisions, do whether you're for-profit or non-profit, we do a lot of non-profit too. Come to the clinic, we will literally do this for you. And it's a, it's, we, we, we have no lack of clients, but I would love to get some, some from um, SUU. We also do, we will file a trademark for you we have, we've probably filed 11 or 12 last semester alone. So if you have a trademark you want to protect, we'll actually get it protected for you. If you have a copyright, we'll do copyrights. Um, and if you, have, if you need us to file patents, we'll file patents. Um, and then we'll also help you protect your trade secrets. Um, and then also if you need a privacy policy, terms of use, user agreement, real estate leases, employment agreements, contracts, license agreements, we'll do all this for you and, um, at, at no cost. What we don't do, we don't do real tax advice other than nonprofit stuff. We don't do disputes or litigation, and we don't do immigration. And all you need to do is, is we're, not, we're off during the summer, but
but we do, or, or we do it during um, um, the fall winter semester, is you just Google BYU Law and Entrepreneurship Clinic. You go become a client, click it through, just say you're from SUU, and I'll move you to the top, top of the queue, as long as we have room. Uh, okay, and I'm going to pause now for just legal questions, or any questions at all that you might have, since we have just a few more minutes. I usually don't talk this long, but I'm nervous. <laughs> any questions about, otherwise I'll dive in and talk about. Um, with corporate structure, it can be, here's, here's a couple of uh, tips I'll give you. Whenever you form a company, you usually think in terms of percentage. Like, I'm going to give you X percent of my company, or we're going to divide it by X percent, percent, percent. Number one, always write that down. Even if you just do it, you don't have the lawyer to do it, just write down who owns what and how they own it. But the biggest mistake you can do with corporate structure is when you write it down, you never use percentage. You always use number of shares or number of units for an LLC. Because if you give me 10% of the company and you only meant to be give me 10 of the 100 existing right now, but you still have 5,000 to issue, but you give me 10%, that means you have to give me 10% of everything else you issue for the rest of life of your country, of your, of your company, which means you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to buy. We invested in a company that, uh, that came off Shark, Shark Take one time and they gave NBC 3% of the company. We said 3% then or 3% now? And Essentially, we had to go to NBC and pay a lot of money to get out of that. So always use numbers, not percentages, when you give out equity. Always write it down. As to whether or not you're a corporation or an LLC, it generally doesn't matter unless you want to raise third-party money. If you want to raise third-party money, always have to be a corporation, generally Delaware, because if you want to be anything else, LLC is fine. So that's the big thing of corporate structure is don't screw up your equity by using percentages, not numbers, and get things written down so that you don't have, this is where you're going to fight. And you're only going to fight if you're successful. If you're a failure, no one cares. If you're successful, you're going to fight. And those fights can be expensive. Um, one of your first fights, too, was it a book that was about the six types of wealth? Or? It's actually just some article. It's this one right here. Just Google six types of wealth, being rich isn't just a money thing by Jack Rains. It's a good read. That's a, that's a very short. Um, I only stole a little bit from him, but it's interesting. Um, on intellectual property, any of you all seen this, the, the social network? You're all so young. What, what's the social network about? It's a movie about the creation of Facebook. Yeah. And just like kind of how you said about those people who were fighting over money. Yeah. Yeah, so you have the, the Winklevoss twins, right? The Olympic rowers. And you have Zuckerberg. And the twins sue Zuckerberg. Why did they sue him? Um, because he tried to, if I'm not wrong, he tried to remove their rights of ownership just to make the property the property. Yeah, he did. Oh, wait, oh, wait. earlier on he made them because he stole their idea. Okay, that's it. Right. The, 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 the twins had no interest in Facebook. Yeah. They didn't own it. And why didn't they own anything in Facebook? I know you're not the Facebook generation, but yes. Yeah. Oh, you're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty well. So with Zuckerberg and the twins get together in Harvard in their dorms. And the, and the twins, he's the, he's the young geek that can code. And the twins, what do the twins want? They want to make like some sort of thing. Like what? They want to make like some sort of thing. Yeah, but based on what? On the Harvard Facebook. Yeah. I mean, when I went, again, I'm Mormon, so when I went, you know, the big thing is, back in the day, you show up at a BYU ward, and they give you something the first day, and it's very important. Anyone know what that would be, what your parents or grandparents used to get? It's the ward picture directory, right? We called it the menu, right? <laughs> And the, 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 the twins wanted a menu from the Harvard Facebooks of all the sororities and frats. So they go to Zuckerberg, say, let's do this idea. They wanted to meet new people. What did Zuckerberg want to do? What did he ultimately do? Did he do that? What is, what is Facebook? He'll work with other but Facebook, even fundamentally, what is Facebook at its fundamental? People you already know. He missed his friends. He was from Seattle. He had no friends. He wanted to reconnect. 
He didn't want to meet anybody new. He wanted to reconnect with people already. The, the high, entire concept of Facebook is not meeting new people. It's reconnecting with people you, you already know. So it's a fundamentally different idea. He said, I don't want to do that. He went home, did Facebook instead. They now come back and say, you used our idea. How much did it cost him to get out of it? I think it was like $100 million. If they would have just sat down and said, Who's who, here's who owns our ideas on a napkin, that saved him $100 million. It's a $100 million napkin. And that's intellectual property is... You have got to get, anyone who touches your product, you need to have them say you own it. Because if, if, if you don't do that, then everybody owns it. And, um, and, and, and this idea of, and also, if you, if you have patents, trademarks, or copyrights, you protect them by making them public. Most of your most valuable intellectual property in this room are going to be what are called trade secrets. That's the Google algorithm, it's the KFC recipe, it's the Coke recipe. It's almost any software company, they do not file their code as a, and copyright it. Any, any software people in here? Why would you not file your code? Because then it's available in detail to everybody. I can just reverse around it. Yeah. That's right. And so you protect it as a trade secret. How do you protect trade secrets? You don't tell anyone. You keep them confidential, the exact opposite. Between anyone who has access to your trade secrets, anyone who has access to your secrets, if you don't have them agree with you to keep them confidential, you lose trade secret protection. You can't recover from those things. You, unless, I mean, if, if, if I touched your product and you come back to me three years later and say, okay, I'm trying to get a big round of financing, will you please sign this inventions agreement and, and transfer to me everything that you own? What's my response generally gonna be? How big of a check is it? We got the name of Tinder for pizza and beer. Some guy walked in and wanted a free pizza and beer at a, at, a, at, a, um, at a hackathon, signed an agreement that says whatever I come up with, you own. We gave him a couple of pieces of pizza, beer, he played ping pong, and it sitting around a bunch of bean bags on Saturday morning. He said, I think Tinder's a good name. Tinder right now is worth two or three billion dollars as a brand. It's extraordinarily, it costs us pizza and beer because he signed the agreement to say whatever my idea is, you own that. You know, if we went back three years later and said, hey, will you transfer that to us? It's not gonna be for pizzas and beer, right? And so that's the intellectual property thing is just be very careful about making sure that you get your ownership, that you understand who owns what when you're coming with ideas and you're sitting around a table um, um, pitching that. Employment, you know, this is where all the lawsuits happen. If you hire bad people, they sue you. And if you don't have them sign intellectual property agreements, it's hard to get them back. Um, anyway, I think we're over. I'll let, we'll do one more. Let one more question. I'm happy to sit around and answer questions if you want. We, we don't pay the filing fees, but there's no other fees. Yeah. So it's, if, you, if, you, if you have a good patent, it's probably worth 25 grand to you to use a clinic. That's what it costs you to have a lawyer to do, to do the work that we'll do for you. You just have to have something that's patentable. Let's give Kirsten a round of applause.